welcome you to Grace Church. If this is your first time here, if you've been here a long time, we want you to know that this is what we believe. If you ever wonder what Grace Church is all about, this is it. I want you to stand and know that this is not this is more than songs. But this is the anthem of our lives. So let our faith be more Greater than the song we sing In our weakness and temptation We believe We believe We believe in God the Father We believe in Jesus Christ we believe in the Holy Spirit, and He's given us a new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that He conquered death. We believe in the resurrection, and He's coming back again. Let the lost be found, and the dead be raised, and the here and now, the love in vain. Let the church live a life. Our God would say, we believe, we believe, and the gates of hell will not prevent, for the power of God has gone away. Now we know your love will never fail, we believe, 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 we believe in the crucifixion. We believe that he conquered death. We believe in the resurrection. And he's coming back, coming back again. He's coming back again. We believe. We believe. Good morning again. I invite you to sing along and make much of Jesus Christ this morning. That's what we celebrate. Happy Easter. Christ the Lord is risen today. Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. Sons of men and angels say, Hallelujah. Raise your joys and triumphs high, hallelujah. Sing ye heavens and earth reply, hallelujah. It's a gift, glorious King, hallelujah. Your old death is now thy sting. Ah, hallelujah. Dying once he all the same. Ah, hallelujah. Where thy victory o'er the grave. Ah, hallelujah. Yours is the glory. Risen God to raise and let's see the victory over death you have won. Sing we to dear is done. Hallelujah. For the fight, the battle won. Hallelujah. 
death in pain forbids him to rise. Ah, hallelujah, Christ has opened paradise. Ah, hallelujah, yours is the glory, yours is the glory, risen consecration. Yours is the victory over death. You have won. Oh, yours is the glory, risen conjuration. And this is the victory over death. You have won. Sing we to our God above. Ah, hallelujah. Praise eternal as his love. Ah, hallelujah. Praise him, all ye heavenly hosts. Ah, hallelujah. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Ah, hallelujah. Yours is the glory. Endless is the victory over death you have won. Yeah, yours is the glory, risen conjuration. Endless is the victory over death you have won. Christ the Lord is risen today. Ah, hallelujah. We were reminded that in, it's in Christ alone. We find our hope, we find our faith, we find love. Sing with us. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still, when striving ceases, my comforter. I all in all, here in the truth of Christ, I stand. Oh, 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 so come flat, all this of God in helpless faith, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. Every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ, I live. Oh, 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 there in the ground, his body lay, by the moonlight of this rain, when bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse had lost his grip on me, for I am his and he is mine. Fought with a 
precious blood of Christ. No guilt, no guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first price to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no sleep of man can ever pluck me from his hands till he returns. Calls me home here in the power of Christ. I stand. Oh, 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 in Christ alone. Oh, 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 Here in the power of Christ, I stand. Here in the power of Christ, I stand. church is an, have an amazing opportunity to partner with parents and families in teaching our kids. That's what the gospel project that they're going to go learn and hear from. That's what it does. It tells, tells the story of the gospel through Genesis to Revelation. And what a great opportunity we have. So I invite everybody to stand on up and continue on in worshiping and praising Jesus Christ, who is the cornerstone of our lives, the foundation. No matter what we're going through, he is Lord of all. He is in control. Sing with us. So this cup 
and his blood support me in the whelming flood when all around my soul gives way he then is all my holy stay he then he then is all my hope and say Christ above cornerstone we face from the through the storm He is Lord Lord of Easter. You know, it is recorded in the book of Matthew, 28th chapter. Uh, it's an encounter that occurred between an angel and some ladies on a Sunday morning checking on the body of Jesus. The angel said to them, he is not here, or he is risen. Three words, he is risen. The most pivotal words in the Bible, most pivotal words almost in human history. The fact that Christ is not dead. He is alive. He is risen. He's seated on the right hand of God the Father. He's interceding for us today. So we do not worship a dead prophet. We are not worshiping a dead God. We are worshiping the risen Savior. He is risen. It used to be in those days there would be a sign countersign between disciples, between followers of Christ. 
one would meet another one and not quite sure whether there's a Christian, he would say, he is risen. And the proper response to prove the person he was talking to is a Christian, he would say, he is risen indeed. So we'll give that a try. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Thank you so much. Uh, that has been texted to me about 10 times this morning, so I had to get that in. But uh, what an incredible day we are celebrating. Because of Christ being resurrected, because of his being alive and interceding for us today, we are meeting on Sunday. It used to be that the Jews and Christians were you know, worshipped on Saturday, but because of the resurrection, it has been changed to Sunday. So we're living proof of the dynamic aspect of that going on today. Let's pray. Lord, we just praise you so much for what you have done. We thank you for Jesus Christ, that he died for us. We thank you, Lord, that Christ on the cross defeated sin and death. We thank you, Lord, that by his blood we can be healed. We, by believing in what he did and who he is, we have saving faith that will see us through any storm, any, any problem in our life, Lord. You are hold us in the palm of your right hand. We thank you that Christ is our rock. He's our high tower. He alone is the one that we're depending on through eternity. And, Lord, that's all a gift. Salvation is a gift. And, Lord, you've offered it so freely to us. But we're the ones who must take that gift. We must unwrap it. We must hold it and embrace it. Lord, we thank you for dying for us. We thank you because of your blood. We can receive you as Lord and Savior and have eternal life. And, Lord, that eternal life doesn't start someday in the future. It starts the very second we receive Christ by faith. So, Lord, we thank you for what you have done. We thank you for what you are doing. We thank you for what you will do. We pray, Lord, the message and the love of Christ would meet the, and the needs of people even here today who have not received you. Lord, for some people in this world, the uh, tomb is still filled. Christ might as well still be there. But for Christians, the tomb is empty. He is now living in our hearts. Lord, what an incredible promise. What an incredible Savior we serve. Again, uh, we thank you for the way you've blessed us in so many ways, even financially. And I pray, Lord, as we return a portion of it to you, that you would bless those offerings for the furtherance of your gospel around the world. In Jesus' name, amen.
I don't know if you've been on social media much this weekend, but if you have, then you probably saw this video at some point during the weekend. Did anybody see this? Raise your hand if you saw this video. Yeah, a few of you. All right, this guy, I, mean, I don't know what he's thinking, but he's thinking that an alligator is something you should, I guess, toy around with, play around with. Anyway, um, he, I'm not sure what he's trying to accomplish there, but if you want to see what happens, I'm going to end it right before... Right there, and so if you want to see the rest, I'll, I will tell you it's not gory though. It's you, you it, it, it's fine, but crazy. I don't know. It's crazy somebody would do that, but you know, I think this idea of Jesus, a lot of people want to kind of just toy around with him, much like this guy with this alligator. That they think that you know, religion, faith, it's a good thing, but it doesn't have to be taken real seriously. And there's a lot of people who want a relationship with Jesus like that, just very casual and just unaware of his incredible power. You know, throughout history, there's a lot of people who have made bold claims. And, in fact, have gotten large followings of people. A lot of people just believe what they say and just give their life to their cause. Many, many people have fallen in that situation. But you know what? You look at all these people on the screen, they're all gone. They're gone. Their history. Jesus Christ, we celebrate the fact that he did not stay in the grave. He was witness to raise to life. And that should make all the difference in the world for somebody who claims to have power and authority, and they prove it by conquering death. Jesus Christ is the most significant figure to ever have lived in history. You realize more songs have been sung about Jesus more paintings have been painted about Jesus. More things have been written about Jesus than anyone ever in history. Anyone ever in history. He had a huge impact. And people, millions and millions of people around this world are celebrating Jesus. I had my friend Ray Dash, who was here a few weeks ago. Go ahead to the next one. Ray Dash, um, who's up here. You guys met him during the mission conference. I had him text me a picture this morning of his church live. And this is not it. didn't have time to get up there because it just came through a minute ago. Of, of his church and them celebrating Easter um, up in Newark, New Jersey. And um, for those who got to know Ray when he was here, just amazing the work that he's doing. And many of you met with his wife. The ladies met with his wife, and his wife talked about how that she and a friend would go out into the streets of Newark. And I don't know if you know anything about Newark, but Newark is an awful, terrible, crime-ridden place that looks like you're in a third world. And his wife and this other lady go out and minister to prostitutes at 1 and 2 o'clock in the morning. This guy is radical. For his faith. And I said, hey, Ray, just send me a picture because we want to see what you're doing there this morning in Newark and the difference God's making because people are celebrating Jesus all around the world, everywhere. And our friend Ray in Newark, at this very moment, his church is meeting. And it's a pretty cool story that Ray, um, when we met Ray, we went up for a mission trip in New York City and we, drove, we rode uh, public transportation from New York City across the river into Newark. And in Newark, that's where Ray brought sent a guy from his church named Israel to meet us and pick us up at the station there. And he picked us up in this junky, junky van. And there was like 20 of us. And we piled into that van, no AC, and like the ceiling, the, 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 the headliner was tearing off. It was, it was horrible. And we piled in there and we went and we did ministry in this community just for one day. And Ray ministers in this place all the time. And just kind of on a side note, Ray called me a few weeks ago when he was here. I said, if there's anything our church can do to encourage you and help you, let me know. Because he doesn't like to ask for money. In fact, they don't take up an offering in their church because he said, I'm not building my, my church on that. Not that there's anything wrong with it, but he said, so many churches in our area, they just exploit people for money. And we want to make sure people know that we're not about that. And, and he called me and he said, 
we totaled our church van. We were driving and somebody hit us and it was completely totaled and the insurance company only gave us $3,200 for it. And he said, would Grace consider matching that gift? And uh, the elders voted unanimously the other day that we would match that gift and give to that a need. And if you want to contribute that need, feel free. If you're a guest here, it's your first time, absolutely, we're not asking you for money this morning. But my point is, God's kingdom and what he's doing across this earth and in places like Newark, New Jersey, is much bigger than we can imagine because Jesus is huge and he's powerful and he's great and we celebrate him because when Jesus changes things, he changes it completely. He renovates completely and when he came to this earth, he did amazing things and he backed it up with his resurrection. And today, we know all scripture is inspired by God But today, I want to look specifically at what some of your Bibles have, the red letters today, the words that are direct quotes from Jesus. Because a lot has been written about Jesus, but let's see what Jesus has to say. So we're going to start in Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, and we're going to look at verse 22 through 26. Luke 9, 22 through 26, and see what Jesus had to say about those who would follow him. Here it is. And Jesus said... And a man must suffer many things. I love it. Jesus wasn't taken by surprise by what happened to him. It was his plan. They sang a beautiful job there. Um, and they, he would be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and must be killed, and on the third day be raised to life. Jesus predicted his death and his resurrection. But then look what he said to us. He said, Then Jesus said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the entire world, the whole world, yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me, in my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father, and the holy angels. When I read a scripture like this, I have to come to the conclusion, there's no middle ground with Jesus. There's no middle ground with Jesus. If you believe in what he said, you respond to him. You either believe or reject him, dismiss him, love him or hate him. But he doesn't give a third option. He doesn't say, believe, but, you know, don't worry about the denial thing. Or, you know, you don't worry about losing your life. There's, that's not a big deal. Just, just the salvation. Let's just be concerned with that. No, Jesus said, hey, if you come after me, deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. But there's too many people who want to claim to be a Christian, but honestly have no real interest in following after Jesus. They claim to know Christ, to claim some, I'm saved, or something happened, but there's no real change that happened and no real desire to follow after Christ. But someone like Jesus, who is powerful, who rose from the dead, he must be taken seriously. Maybe you're here because it's the thing to do. You had to find a church today. That's the thing you're supposed to do in the South. And you say, well, I don't buy Jesus. I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm just here because I, you know, I was talked into it or you know, it was what I was supposed to do. But I, you know, I, I reject him. I don't accept him. Okay, if you want to roll the dice and say, you know, historically, Jesus, you know, I'm not buying that people actually saw him after his death, that's an option. You have that choice to make. But on the flip side, those of you who claim to believe in him, Jesus says, if you want to follow me, lose your life. Lose your self-righteousness. Lose your pride. Lose your claim to any possessions that you have. Lose yourself to any goals that you might have. Lose yourself to your good works. Jesus says, give it up. Lose it. And there, there you find me. Several years back, I was meeting with a group of high school senior guys, small group of guys, and time was running short for these guys. I knew they were quickly getting close to graduation and would be going off and scattering out to different colleges. And, you know, my heart was really burdened, especially for a few of them, because I just didn't know where they stood. They, they could talk the religious talk, but my heart just didn't feel good about where they were at. And I pushed them really hard. I said, guys, 
where are you at in your faith? I said, I would respect you so much more to just be honest with me and just say, you know what, not really there than to just give lip service to this, but you know in your heart it's not true. And one guy, we'll call him Jacob, one guy looked at me and he said, Pastor John, I'll be, I'll be honest with you. When I get out of my parents' house, I'll walk away from my faith. This, this isn't real in me. It's not real. I don't believe. It's like, man, you know, at least you're being honest. I respect you for that. And some people in here need to be honest about what's going on in your life, that you want Jesus at a some level, but you really don't want him. That you don't want to be a true follower. You don't want to turn over your life and lose your life for him. Maybe some of you, it's just because you've based your faith on just incorrect belief. Maybe at some church you attended at some point, maybe they didn't really teach the Bible and what the Bible said, and maybe you put your faith in some other things. Maybe you put your faith in a prayer you excited, recited one time. Nowhere in the Bible do you find, pray a prayer for salvation. Now, the prayer can be your giving it all to God, just losing yourself and putting your faith completely in Him. But if you're just banking your faith on, I said that prayer that time, you need to run to the cross today. Maybe you're basing on, you know, my parents told me I went to the altar one time, but there's nothing genuine in your heart. There's no real desire to know and follow Jesus. You need to run to the cross today. Maybe you grew up in churches where it was all about the works that you did. Maybe you thought, you know, if I do enough good things, that's going to outweigh my bad things at the end of life, and then I'll make it in. And you're basing it on just bad beliefs. Today I'm calling you to see the words of Christ and see that he said, come and die, that you might truly live. I think most people are familiar with the verse, even if this is your first time in church, your first time in a long time. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And I think for a lot of people, that's where your salvation rested in the fact that I want that eternal life, but I don't really want Jesus. You know, I'm, I'm even not really sure about the whole Jesus faith, resurrection thing completely, but you know what, I need a security blanket, I need a, a fallback plan just in case it's true. And so it's really not about Jesus, it's really about yourself. And it's really about you wanting that security. But the resurrection changed, changes everything. Anytime you write down the date, 2014, what are you writing? 2014 from what? 2014 years from the day that Jesus, God, invaded this earth as a man, split history in two, but died on the cross and was crucified and rose again. Don't you think that if Jesus impacted history to the point that we've changed our entire dating system based upon him, that billions, I could say safely, billions of the people around this world are worshiping him this Easter. Don't you think if Jesus changed this world that much, shouldn't there be a change in you at some level when you came and put your faith in Christ and trusted Christ? The crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus radically changed this world, and it should radically change you. We've been looking at this idea of why did Jesus die. And today, I just want to simply look at the fact that Jesus died to give us eternal life. We've talked for several weeks about the things, and there's many things that Jesus died for us. Jesus died for, for, to give us salvation. Jesus died to appease the wrath of God. Jesus died to prove that he was who he said was through the resurrection. Many reasons. But Jesus died to give us eternal life. But as Buzz mentioned today, sometimes we have a misunderstanding of what eternal life is. Let's look at some more of Jesus' words. Jesus' words in John chapter 17. We're going to look at verse 1 through 3. He says, Father, the hour has come. Again, before his crucifixion, he's predicting it. Glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those who you have given him. 
Now look at verse 3. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Let me read that one more time. Look at that. Jesus defines eternal life. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So Jesus doesn't define eternal life in chronological terms, the way that we want to define it as the future and we that's it. Jesus defines it as a relationship, personally knowing God. Not knowing about God, but personally knowing God. And when you come to know Christ, it changes who you are. It changes your behavior, your outlook, your goals, your aspirations, your hope, because you give it all to Him and say, I'm dying so I can truly live. I'm dying so I can truly live. Lately, you know, wedding season is definitely coming around the corner, and the last um, few months I've done quite a bit of premarital counseling. Um, just finished the second couple in a matter of three months that I finished their premarital counseling. I'm doing another uh, premarital counseling sessions with another couple. And one thing I'm always very clear to tell couples when I'm doing premarital counseling with them, I, I say, you have no idea, if you're not living together, you have no idea how much being in a, in a marriage relationship with someone is going to change your life. I said, every dollar that you allocate, every moment that you spend your time doing something, every decision that you make affects the other person. Can I get an amen from, yeah, from uh, some people in here that are married to affirm that for our unmarried couples in here? Everything that you do affects this person. So you can't just live independently anymore and think, I can just do my thing and what, what impact does it have on this marriage? But the two people became one. And in one, now everything that happens affects each other. And the same is true with our relationship with Christ. When we enter into a shared relationship with Jesus, it should change the way that we view life and the way that we see life because we understand that Christ took up residence in our life. And we're not our own. And it changes everything. It changes everything. And here's the truth. What we do is a better evidence of what you believe than whatever you can say, whatever you can think, and whatever you can feel. The things that you do, look at your life. The things that you do are a lot more revealing about your faith than the things that you say. The things you feel, the things you think. And I talk to people all the time, and you do too, you see them all the time, who say they know Jesus, but they live like the devil, don't they? People who come to church and they give you the good heaven talk on Sunday, and then they go out and live like hell the rest of the week, right? And they claim to be a Christian. They claim to know Jesus. That's a problem. And Jesus said it was a problem. And Jesus is our example. And when we become a Christian we became a follower of Christ. It's not we become a Christian and then we try our best. It's everything's changed. Everything's changed. We've died. Our life is hid with Christ and God. And our desires, our wants, our needs, and our aspirations change completely. Think about just some of the practical things that Jesus said about those who would follow him. Let me read you one from Matthew 20, 26-28. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus served. He says he served others to the point of giving his life away. And he tells his disciples, if you want to follow me, if you want to be great in my kingdom, serve. But how is it that people who claim to be Christian, claim to know Christ, have no desire to serve other people? They're like my friend who was honest with me. You know what? He wanted to just make a lot of money. He told me, I want to make a lot of money. I want to do what I want in life. You know, that's, I, I'm not buying the faith thing because I, I want to be successful in my life. He didn't want to serve. Other things we see from Jesus. He was in constant communication with the Father. 
Don't you think if God put his spirit within you, there should be some desire to commune with God, to talk to God, not just when I'm in trouble or things are going bad or in haywire, then I pray and God fix this for me. But don't you think that if God has taken up residence in your life, that there should be a desire to communicate with him, to know him. How about his will? A desire for his will to come to pass. If you've prayed the Lord's Prayer, and I'm sure most of you have, what do you say? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Crying out for God's will to be done. I think it falls back to the verse we looked at earlier where it said that we had to deny ourselves daily doesn't mean we're perfect, but there's a constant death and there's this desire within you that says, Jesus, I want to live life like you because of what you've done for me, the radical change you've made in my life. I want to serve. I want to, I want to commune with you. And I don't have a perfect, I don't understand completely what, you know, what to do because I'm early on in my, in my faith walk, but I do know there's this desire within me to commune with you, to talk with you, and to know you and have your will done. A really haunting verse, Matthew 7, 21. This is Jesus talking. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So he says, it's not just because you give lip service to me, but you understand this change brings about a change of perspective, a change of relationship. Eternal life starts at the moment of true salvation. And at that point, Christ makes all the difference in the world. If he can change history through the cross and through the resurrection, don't you think your faith in him should start bringing about some changes in your life? The next thing, eternal life is about a quality of life. It's about a quality of life. Eternal life is the life of God in every believer. And when that happens... We see that fulfillment, meaning, purpose, all those things are found in God and knowing Him and knowing His glory. Just like Jesus, the glory of God becomes our true longing. The next thing, eternal life, it will ultimately bring Jesus' disciples into a lasting relationship with Him and His divine glory. We will. It does have an eternal, ongoing time, chronological aspect. But that's down in verse 24 of chapter 17. Jesus starts out and says, it's about a relationship. And he says, I want my children who I know and they know me. I want them forever to spend eternity with me and to know my glory. And if eternal life starts now, we taste that glory today on earth to some level. But one day we'll see it in its fullness. But the problem is, Honestly, if you have no desire to taste the glory of Christ on this earth, do you really long for seeing his glory in heaven? If you long for his glory here, we're going to be overwhelmed when we see him face to face and our faith becomes sight. There should be a desire for God's glory in your life, and God's will in your life. John 3, 36, Jesus said this. He said, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. So we find our destiny. We find eternal life through Jesus. But if we reject Jesus, God's wrath remains on us. And then the fourth thing, Eternal life is free for anyone who believes. Eternal life is free for anyone who believes. This guy on the screen here with these colorful balloons, his name is Antonio de Carli, and he's from Brazil. He was from Brazil. And he had the brilliant idea that he would hook up a thousand party balloons to his chair and make a flight. Great idea, right? Great idea. And during this flight, 
he tragically ended in his death. Not to make light of that, but you know what? As I was reading the story, it made me think that, you know what? That guy had faith, man. He had faith, didn't he? He really thought that a thousand party balloons could keep him afloat, and then that he could shoot those things with his BB gun, and, and then it would bring him back down to earth. Unfortunately, it didn't happen that way for him. But he did have faith. When you believe something, you're going to put your trust, you're going to put your hope in it. And unfortunately, he put his faith and trust and hope in something that did not come to pass. And just because you believe something strongly doesn't mean it's true. And so we've got to make sure our faith is in Christ, in something that's true, it's accurate, it's real, it's historically true that he rose from the dead. And when we have that kind of belief, then our faith is such that we put our faith, we put our hope in something so much that we say, I'm trusting it. I'm trusting it. And if I turn around on the stage right here, and I just said, I'm falling backwards, and I think Sarah Castoria will catch me. Probably not a good idea, but if I fall, I really believe that, right? I really believe she's going to jump up, save Pastor John at the last moment. But if I say that and don't do it, does that really prove anything? And the same thing with our life in God. Don't give Jesus lip service and say, Jesus, yes, Lord, 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 when it's convenient, when it's good, when it's comfortable, when it's easy, and then say, not really going to follow you. I really have no new desire to follow you. If I really got pushed, I would probably say that, yeah, not, not so much, not so much. That's a problem. That's a problem. And Jesus says, come to me. All you are labored and are burdened. He says, I'll give you rest in me. You'll find rest for your souls. Jesus, the crucifixion, the resurrection answers the questions of life. Why am I here? What's my purpose? What's my meaning? And it's not just based in some wishful, hopeful idea that may or may not pan out. It's based in on historical evidence that Jesus, on the third day, walked away from a tomb, defeated death, defeated hell, was witnessed by countless people and documented in every same way that those world leaders that we put up on the screen were a, a little while ago. Jesus lived. He died for our sins. And he rose to life. The question is, how will you respond to that? Will you say, Jesus, I'm bringing it all to you. I'm tired of giving you lip service. I'm tired of just mildly just accepting what you say. No, I'm bringing my life. I'm losing my life for you. And in that, you find Jesus in a relationship and eternal life. I have three ways to respond this morning to this, and this is probably unusual. You've never seen this before, but we're going to have communion. I'm going to ask the elders to come on up and go ahead and start getting ready to pass it out. And if you're, go ahead, guys. If you're a believer in here, take communion. Take the bread, and it represents the body of Christ, and the juice represents the blood of Christ. If you're not a believer in here, this is a time where it's better to say, you know what, I'm not going to partake. I'm not going to fake it. I'm not going to go through the motions on that. But if you're here, listen, if you're here and you said, for the first time, I get it. For the first time, I understand that I can't hold on and save my life. I've got to give my life away to Jesus. Let this act of communion be what's happening in your heart, that you're responding to communion saying, I'm taking it. And this is a sign of my faith of what happened in my heart through me reaching out and taking the bread and the cup. Let this communion time be your response. So guys, go ahead and pass that out. And then we'll take it all together when they're finished. And then also we're going to do something else. We're going to do baptism right as after, before we take communion, right after we get the elements passed out. And Sue Lippum is going to be baptized today. So awesome that she's going to be baptized. But I'm, I'm going to say this, and this, 
This is unusual, but that's okay. If today that you're sitting in here and you say, I need Jesus. I don't know Jesus, and I need Jesus. You know, I may be dressed in my Easter clothes. I may be not even prepared. I don't even have a towel, but you know what? I'm going to follow Sue's lead, and I'm going to come up here today, and I'm going to be baptized as a sign to show that I'm giving it all. You know, baptism is an example of that. It says, I'm dying with Christ, and I'm being raised again in a new life. Nothing about that baptism does anything special. That water's not holy water. It's carted in from somewhere that does something special to wash away your sins. It's a sign of externally of what's happened internally in your heart. And so maybe somebody in here, you're just saying, I'm tired of the games. I'm ready. That's okay if nobody responds, but maybe somebody in here says, Jesus, I'm going to lose my life today. And I'm not afraid to stand up and make a fool out of myself for it. Amen. Do it. So as the band plays, Jesus paid it all. Just ask that you take your communion elements, and just in a second we'll baptize Sue over here. Savior say thy strength indeed is small child of weakness watch and pray find in me thine all in all Jesus paid it all all to him I owe Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt. 
God raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my we praise the one, Jesus, who raised this life from the dead of praise. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt. And raise this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt. And raise this life up from the dead. You can have a seat. This is Sir Lipham. What amazing testimony today to sit here, to come forward and be baptized and just say, I'm putting my faith, my hope, my trust in Jesus. And as a sign of what was happening in her heart, she says, I want to display this through baptism. What an awesome thing. And I know this is something that she is taking very, very seriously. And we should all be moved by the fact that someone is placing your hope and faith and life in Jesus Christ. Sue, have you placed your faith and hope and trust in Jesus? Yes. Based upon your profession of faith, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk a new life in Christ Jesus. Amen. I'd just like to say, the water is warm, thanks to Tony Cooper getting here and fixing it. <laughs> and I'm, I'm serious. If you want to be baptized right now, say, I'm, I don't want to delay. I put my faith in Christ today, and I want to walk up here in front of this crowd and say, this is what's done. What happened in my heart today. Respond. Respond to his call. Anybody. Everyone else, maybe you're sitting there, anyone else, and you say, I do want to put my faith in Christ today. I have done that. And through taking communion today, that's the sign. That's the symbol I'm going to show of what's happened in my life. That maybe you've taken communion before, or maybe you never have in your life. Maybe you say, today, this is the real deal. I'm taking part in the life of Christ. I'm embracing Christ for the first time, truly. I'm turning, repenting of sin. doesn't mean you're going to be perfect, but you understand that Jesus died because of sin. Jesus died because God's wrath upon sin. And you say, I'm giving up my dreams, my life, my possessions, my everything. Today, I'm laying before you and me taking this wafer. I'm partaking in the life of Christ. Christian, you've done that. Respond today. And let's take the bread together. Jesus, when he was telling his disciples at the Last Supper, he said, when you take this bread and you drink this cup, you remember my death until I come. So as we take and drink the cup, we're saying, Jesus, I'm remembering the sacrifice you made for my sin. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you today that we celebrate Jesus Christ, risen in power and glory. And Jesus, you changed this world, and you're changing our hearts. You're renovating our lives. 
And Father God, I pray for anyone here who's rejecting your move and your spirit on their life today, God. May your spirit convict them. May they break down those walls of resist, resist, resisting. And embrace you, Jesus, as Sue showed today in baptism, just giving everything to you and dying with you so she can find life. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. My sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Have a great week.